one of the challenges with close to home is like anything to do with youth justice these days, um, trends have been coming down so um, steadily that it's easy to point to success if you point to the last 10 years of trends. But it's very hard to uh, attribute individual actions and policy changes and structures and connect them to those trends, controlling for the general decline. Um, and that's the, that's the thing the city faces and the state faces right now. Um, and it's very hard to do that. I was talking to Michelle Sverdoff earlier um, about, uh, I can't imagine how much information she has crammed into her um, <laughs> mind after all these years and all the jargon and the little knowledge about how this thing works and that thing works and what that number means and that number means. Um, having moved to New York four years ago, I can tell you that it's one of the hardest uh, systems I've ever tried to understand. Um, and I've worked in a lot of different systems around the country, mostly for short-term projects. But New York system, with all the different organizations and bureaucratic barriers and city-state differences, makes it very, very hard to get the overall view of what's happening with youth justice. Um, VIR is probably, the VIR Institute's better at that than um, any other uh, certain, certainly nonprofit or uh, university-based organization I know. Um, and Jen is the leading researcher in their center on youth justice. So, Jen. Thank you, Jeff. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay, so my name is Jennifer Fratello. I'm the research director in the Center on Youth Justice at the Vera Institute of Justice. I know many of you know me, and, and many of you know Vera. Um, for those of you who don't know Vera, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan um, research organization. We work with government partners to make justice systems fairer and more effective. And, and um, practice and so Vera's role in close to home has been a really interesting one we've been really honored to work with the, um, the juvenile justice leaders both in the city and the state over the past um, eight to ten years on a variety of initiatives um, we've worked closely with the state office of children and family services we've worked with the mayor's office of criminal justice um, the administration for children's services and the department of probation on a variety of initiatives around sort of data and technical assistance, um, evidence-based practices, using sort of data to inform decision-making as well as risk assessment. Um, we're also, we also provide a lot of support and we're active members of the Juvenile Justice Advisory Group and we work specifically on the data subcommittee as well as the community-based intervention subcommittee um, and that's been a really interesting and fulfilling role for us. Um, and we also manage a database for the city of um, juvenile justice information that sort of tracks every delinquency case um, as they go through the system beyond the point of uh, disposition and, and now tracks them up till their 25th fifth birthday that's happened okay so we've gotten lots of support from the city and state to do that too and and you know we think it's been a, a huge um, effort and a, and a really good resource for the city as they sort of remain committed to really tracking data and using data to monitor every initiative that they're involved in so I was asked to come here today to talk about the numbers and the data and sort of what's changed um, over the course of the past 10 years, five years, two years, as we've seen close to home. Um, and it's a really hard question to answer. So a, a lot's changed um, and a lot's been going on. And, and so it's really hard to say, you know, we, we see X percent change in, in sort of dispositions and we, we <clears throat> excuse me, we can relate that directly to close to home or to the implementation of the detention risk assessment instrument. You know, there's a lot that's been going on and so it's, it's sort of this body of reform and, and we can sort of look and see how things change over time and, and, you know, it's really interesting. So it goes back 10 years ago when it all started, when the city realized that they needed um, more community and evidence-based practices for um, young people who appeared to be placement bound, so young people who would be going into placement, um, and they started programs in the community like the ACS's Juvenile Justice Initiative and Esperanza. Um, and it continued in 2006 when they realized that they needed to do detention a little differently, and so um, as Liz spoke about, we, we sort of worked with the city to create a continuum of alternative to detention programs and to design and implement an evidence-based risk assessment instrument that caused, um, that resulted in huge decreases in the use of detention and, and sort of targeting resources to, to sort of kids who appeared to be risky and, and um, 
seemed most appropriate for detention. Um, and now here we are. So we're, we're looking at close to home. We're sort of mid-course um, and examining the success of it, sort of weighing, balancing the complementary goals of sort of further reductions in incarceration when we know that the reductions, many of the reductions have already happened, um, and really just this focus on keeping young people close to home in their communities whenever possible. So we can start by looking, I think, 14 years back. I'm, I'm going to do this sort of conceptually. If you have the data slides and you can follow along, that's great. But if not, um, I'll, just, I'll just give you the, the sort of punchline. Um, if we look at the state incarceration numbers, so for New York State as a whole, <clears throat> Um, if we go back to 1998 and look at the number of placements or admissions to state, um, to state custody, there's been a really drastic decrease. So back in 1998, we saw 2,383 admissions to statewide custody, um, and in 2011, that number had gone down to 950, and it continued to shrink in 2000, um, 2012 as well. Now, most of this proceeds close to home, obviously. We're looking back to 1998, um, but the takeaway is really striking. So we're starting at a baseline of, of a 65% decrease in the number of youth placed over the past roughly 15 years before we even started close to home. Um, so now let's look more specifically at New York City in more recent years. So let's look at um, five-year period of 2009 to 2013. Um, what we see is a, a continuing downward trend sort of across the board, um, in part, again, because of close to home, but a lot of this proceeds close to home. Um, and, you know, more than likely due to this sort of ongoing culture of reform and this emphasis on sort of de-incarceration of, of the most appropriate youth and really targeting resources to um, youth who really appear to be risky and sort of prioritizing uh, services in the community. Um, just in case you missed the citation for the slides, if you want to see them, it's bitly.com, B-I-T-L-Y.com slash Vera PDF. There's also a Vera PPT if you prefer to look at the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> okay, so I'm about to get into some New York City data. So if anyone does want to want the slides, I'll give you a second to pull them up. Um, from 2009 to 2013, we saw a large decrease in arrests. I'm going to sort of walk through three really important points of the system so to sort of paint a picture of what the system looks like and how it changed here in New York City. Um, delinquency arrests declined by 43% in that period, so a huge, huge decrease. That's almost half. Um, we saw almost 13,000 arrests in 2009 um, and 7,300 arrests last year in 2013. And, and, you know, we don't really know why this has happened. It's probably a combination of a lot of things. I think, you know, behavior, youth behavior has changed. I think the system's response to that behavior has changed. Um, and many other things have changed as well. Um, so next, we can look at the number of family court petitions in that same time period. Um, so these are formal filings of delinquency cases. In that five-year time period, they declined by 38%. Um, from almost 5,500 in 2009 to 3,392 in 2013. Now, we, little, we know a little bit more about why this is. So first of all, the arrest shrunk, but we also know that um, the Department of Probation was doing some really um, innovative and aggressive um, diversion programs and sort of, sort of triaging the, the kids who sort of look like maybe they do need to go through the system um, and, and kind of kicking out the kids who, had, who were coming in with the less serious charges. Um, and then we can look at dispositions. So the number of dispositions to placement dropped by 38%. So 758 placement dispositions in 2009 to 464 in 2013. So again, another really significant drop in the, in the number of young people who were disposed to placement. Uh, but this is where statistics and, and numbers can get really tricky. So you know, a major focus of many of the reforms in the past five years was sort of shrinking the front end of the system, so kind of narrowing the net of kind of who comes in the front door and goes through a formal court case. So what you end up having is a smaller pool of young people who have more serious charges, who look a bit riskier. So when you start to measure the rate at which they flow through the system, you actually may start to see that more people are being petitioned, more people are going to placement, um, simply in terms of rates, not numbers. Um, and, and that plays out a little bit when we start to look at the rates. So if we look at the rate of juvenile arrests, so that's the rate relative to the youth population in New York City, it also fell um, about 
25%. So now, sorry, I'm just looking at the time period from 2012 to 2013 to really focus on the, the sort of close to home um, time period. Um, the rate of petitions, so now this is a rate of cases that are formally petitioned um, with the baseline being the number of cases that are arrested, that actually increased by 16%. Now that's not a bad thing, again, the, the pool is smaller, they're riskier kids. Um, and the rate of placement, it decreased, but it decreased very modestly, so it decreased by just 4%. Again, smaller pool of kids, more likely to sort of penetrate the deeper part of the system. So it's not to say that the initiative hasn't been a success, in fact, probably argue the opposite um, based on these observations and, and, you know, many of the things that Liz was talking about. Um, and, you know, I will point out that New York City has retained really remarkably low rates of placement across the board um, over the past several years, and the data shows that there's sort of ongoing declines, even if those declines are, are pretty, pretty small and relatively modest, I think, you know, in, in a system that operates the way it does and uses placement as a disposition option, you might argue that it can't kind of get much lower. You might argue it, that it can. So um, I think we'll hear some of that in the panel. So the takeaway or, you know, the story that doesn't really jump out from the recent numbers is that if we're trying to measure the success of the initiative by looking at numbers and recent declines in rates and things like that, we're sort of not really getting the whole picture. Um, you could argue a lot of that decrease had happened prior to the implementation of close to home. Um, you could argue the baseline was already pretty low, and so there wasn't a whole lot lower you could go. Um, I think the real success story here is the massive shift in the use of resources, and there's a, there's a few slides in that packet that show how the uh, resources went from the sort of using these, these state custody model to the more local custody model, um, increased use of alternative displacement programs that are run by the Department of Probation as sort of month by month went on in the first year of close to home. Um, and the really important thing is what that means for youth and families that interact with this part of the system. Thank you.